Hello and welcome again to the Rider Review. This is Eric Rod Ryder, and this week we're going to be taking a look back at the 1999 sports drama titled Any Given Sunday. Now Any Given Sunday runs for two hours and 42 minutes long. It is directed by Oliver Stone. It is produced by Richard Donner, Oliver Stone, Dan Helstead, Lauren Schuler, Donner, and Clayton Townshend. The script was written by John Logan and Oliver Stone. It is based off of the novel of the same title by Pat Toomey. The score was done by Richard Horowitz and Paul Kelly. The cinematography by Salvatore Tottino. And it was edited by Stuart Levy, Thomas Nordberg, Keith Salmon, and Stuart Wakes. And the stars of the movie, this is a star-studded film. It stars Al Pacino, Cameron Diaz, Dennis Quaid, James Woods, Jamie Foxx, LL Cool J, Matthew Rodine, Carlton Heston, Anne Margaret, Aaron Eckert, John C. McGinley, Bill Bellamy, Lila Rochon, Elizabeth Berkeley, and Marty Wright. And it also has cameo appearances from ex-NFL players like Dick Buttkiss, Y.A. Tittle, still say that sounds dirty, Pat Toomey, Warren Moon, Johnny Unitas, Ricky Waters, Emmett Smith, Terrell Owens, and legendary football coach Barry Switzer. Though very clever in its delivery, Any Given Sunday was overly dependent in its production team. So while the movie is quite observant in terms of showcasing the dramatic moments quite effectively, there are moments where the action scenes have an MTV-like atmosphere going for it, which can be distracting. Why MTV? It's because it, sometimes, sometimes the scenes, especially the ones on the football field, feel like something taken from an MTV movie music video. So uh, it, instead of, you know, like, making it sound or making it feel like an authentic classic football game, it turns out that it's just like way too dramatized and way too hyperbolic to be even considered really serious. At least the underlying story is implemented into the plot, which is very effective. So the, so the script is really, really top notch here. Uh, definitely it's got Oliver Stone's fingerprints throughout most of it. So while the emphasis of football is in the works in this movie, I thought it would be a great time to do a football-themed movie since recently the Kansas City Chiefs defeated the San Francisco 49ers. So, you know, hats off to the, the Kansas City Chiefs for their win. So I thought maybe I would do a review based off of this, based off of football. And any given Sunday is just one of the many. Um, we learn the unpredictable futures that worry court veteran quarterbacks and how injuries have an impact on players who are more willing to take risks of their own being just to get back into the game. Yes, all the, all the formulaic uh, scenarios seem to come into the picture here. Even though it's more fully fleshed out, it's still explained in a much longer detail because of the fact that this movie does go on for roughly two hours and 45 minutes. So, you know, all the, all the cliches come into effect in this movie. Even though a lot of these sports themed movies, the cliches seem to take on a more comical turn. This movie has a much more serious tone to it. But we kind of learn the ins and outs of football. You know, we don't just see, you know, a bunch of players on the field trying to take a take that oval shaped ball and just drag it across and just carry it across one end of a field to another. No. We don't just look at the at the at the game itself but also the business behind it and what goes on off the gridiron. And, you know, whether you're a football player, a coach, a manager, a referee, 
a sportscaster. Everybody who takes part in football will have their moments ahead. We don't just look at the game itself, but we also look at, at football in a business sense. Because in some ways, I guess to survive in football, it also requires quite a bit of business savviness just to keep us entertained. Just to keep, you know, everything going, everything smoothly. I mean, I know that the world in football is rough, even if you're not a football player. Sure, for a football player, you know, you have to worry about injuries. You have to worry about your your safety, about your livelihood, about, you know, like where you're going to go in the future once your football career is over. You know, you also have to plan and think for the future as well. I mean, sure, it's fine to to go out there and be your best. But you also need some other alternative to turn to once your career is over. Um, they also you look at how injuries have an impact on players. You also look at, how, at the business side, especially with the managers and the CEOs and all these other top bigwig business gurus out there. Some of these people don't even really care about the sport. All they care about is winning and making money. Uh, also, to keep the teams in their respective stadiums, you know, you go through all that. You go through how it, what it, what it's like to be a coach, especially if you're a team who's an underdog and needs to make that kind of Cinderella story come to life. And although it, it is effective in its storytelling about the ins and outs of football, the thing is, what's a real weakness in this movie is that sometimes scenes just seem to jump from one scene to another without really fully settling in. Or that it wants to put everything into the movie, but there's just so little resources and so little time that we just don't have time to cover everything. And that's kind of where this movie is at its weakest points. Another thing, too, like I said, the cliches are all there. We've learned the unpredictable futures that worry veteran quarterbacks and how injuries will have an impact on players who are more than willing to take risks of their own being just to get back in the game. And how we, and uh, another subplot about an inexperienced rookie who has a few very good successful plays, and now it's just got all, all into his head and has turned himself into a real jerk who doesn't care about the rules, but just wants to go by his rules, and that's about it. Even going so far as to give the impression that ESPN news broadcasters are just self-promoters, you know, root for this team and you'll get a free T-shirt and things like that. Is that all they're doing? It's just sales pitching, that's all. You also get owners' wives that are just inebriates who who like to bask in the sun while they sip martinis and drink champagne. Then you got you got precocious daughters who know more about football than their fathers. You know, just because you know their father taught her the ropes and all that. She thinks that she knows more about football than him. But really, she doesn't really care about the football, the sport itself, but just wants to make money. And we also know, and we also have the coaches who sort of act like motivational speakers, especially when the games are not in their favor. Their usual spiel is, they would put everybody sitting at the table. They'll yell at you for like five, ten minutes. And then the last few minutes, they'll be like all, you know, like begging and pleading and then showing reassurance, you know. They'll yell at you. They'll scream at you. They'll be pissed off at you. And the next thing you know, they'll mellow down and say, I want you to do the best for me. 
I don't care about winning, but what I do care about is effort type of stuff. If we go out on top, we'll go out on top. But if we don't, we'll die trying. You know, that kind of encouragement. And you get that in this movie as well. And at the closing moments of important games end with some last minute exciting play. Like something always dramatic happens at the last minute. Whether the team triumphs or fails. Some last minute stuff comes into effect here. Which is cliche. Not very believable. But I guess there's some good storytelling behind that as well. These features really offer nothing new to the sports movies at all. But director Oliver Stone and the performers give their respected character to each scenario and dialogue, and it has an effect to the story. So who are the standout performers here? Al Pacino definitely shines as the cranky, smoky-voiced coach Tony D'Amato who is dedicated in coaching the Miami Sharks from becoming a zero to becoming state champions as he's joined by top-notch performers. We know that all the pivotal scenes are unoriginal and the cliches are just spread everywhere. Some of these are just noteworthy, stuff like that. One of the things that kind of is disturbing is the fact that is it true that these football players tend to like to live the moments all the time? No, that is not true. They do not spend their times in their rich, elaborate penthouses, swimming in a pool, drinking wine, having thousands of women jump into the pool, partying, drugs, and things like that. No, that does not happen even during the football season. It might happen during the postseason, you know, after they've after they've gone through months of performing. They might probably take a month break, but during the football season, they do not spend their times partying and taking drugs. That comes after. Maybe maybe after the Super Bowl they might take a month or two off, but then once their month or two off is done, it's back to training again. I mean, these guys are supposed to eat, sleep, and breathe football, not partying and taking drugs. That's absurd. And, you know, some of the ways how these characters speak, I mean, the football players, they seem to act like almost like ghetto gangsters with the way they talk. I mean, it's regardless, and it's got nothing to do with skin color or race or whatnot. It seems like Every football player seems to tend to talk ghetto, which is totally untrue. I mean, maybe some of them might use that kind of tone of talk and language, but it's not really believable because not all of them talk like that. Coaches, as always, in every movie, coaches are always crabby, cranky, and they're always either yelling at their players and then they start to soften up later. They give their motivational speaking bullshit out. And you think that that's going to solve all their problems? No. It might, it might help to realize that, you know, I'm a human. They're humans too. But still, motivational speaking will not get you a, a championship. Hard work, dedication, and the will to win is the way you win. Barking at you, yelling at you is probably going to add more fear and intensity into you, which will make, which is more likely to cause nervous reactions than winning championships. So, you know, this is where one of the big cliches one of the real weaknesses in the movie is because it's too overdone with cliche. Jamie Foxx uh, joins the fray as rookie quarterback Willie Beeman, who has the opportunity to shine as the superior quarterback, has been 
carried out due to an injury. With his lack of experience, he gets so overwhelmed, he starts vomiting on the field, but then eventually becomes an overnight sensation, which eventually his cockiness, his conceit, maybe his potential rise to fame, but could also be his inevitable decline. You know, once he, once his formula wears off, people will become sick of him. Fox goes through all the changes in his character professionally, from an unsure rookie to a cocky celebrity, to becoming demanding all in one swipe. So we see the evolution of this guy's character. First of all, he comes on, he makes his rookie debut, his debut onto the field, and what does he do? He eats breakfast, but it just doesn't go down. It comes right back up. I mean, is that his trademark? Is that what Willie Beeman's trademark is? He comes on the field just a puke. I mean, it's bad enough these football players have to go through the disgusting initiative by wallowing in the dirt just to grab a ball, of an oval-shaped ball, and just grab it from one end of the field to the other just to collect six points. But now that now do they have to not only roll around in the grass and the mud, but also on someone's vial? Ugh. But I do like the evolution that Jamie Foxx's character Willie Beeman goes through from an inexperienced rookie to all of a sudden he's had a few good successful plays and has managed to be a, a key in the team's winning ways that now he's become this cocky celebrity who's like way over his head. And then he would later, of course, eventually change to mellow down and become more about the team and less about himself. So I do kind of like some of the character development of Jamie Foxx's character. Um, I think he actually turns in the second best performance after Al Pacino. The original owner of the team was a legend of the game who hired D'Amato as a game of chance. But then the owner dies and passes the legacy to his daughter, Christina Pagniacci, played by Cameron Diaz, while her mother, Margaret, played by Anne Margaret, is never shy of consuming martinis. Cameron Diaz's character could almost be passed off like the stereotypical villain CEO type. In every movie that deals with business or shady dealings, whether regardless of gender, male or female, they always seem to somewhat be cast in this kind of cliche fashion of not caring about the team, not caring about the concerns of others, but just out to make money. She's a more of a business person than a football, than a football fan. She doesn't even she even actually goes out to admit that she doesn't even like the doesn't even like football. And to her, it's just business. Of course, what she wants to do is she wants to move the franchise to another city. Why? Because the money is handsomer there. Of course, you know, there's going to be people who are going to oppose this request, but hey, she's stubborn, she's pig-headed, she's determined, but she's also cliched because in every movie, anybody that deals with a with a with a a leader in the in the board of directors, they're always portrayed as these evil money scheming villains who are only in it for the business sake. And that's kind of like what you get from Cameron Diaz's character, Christina Pagniacci. Sure, her role will may attract the male audience, 
we know the women will not feel at place in this world. And though Anne Margaret knows it, Christina feels she knows better about football than the coaches and the players. I mean, just because her father owned a franchise, she thinks she knows everything and more about it than her father. When really she doesn't care. And she's not about the game, but more about the business. It's not about the uniforms. It's more about the suits and the ties and the commercialism. Christina thinks by moving the franchise under her lead will bring money to her pockets. Her mother never felt inspired by the game and has steered clear. Her mother doesn't really care about football either. As long as her family can make money, she can still wear the elaborate clothes and consume as many as many bubbly drinks going. A little bit of the bubbly. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. I always wanted to say it too. Time for a little bit of the bubbly. Isn't that what Chris Jericho said when he won the inaugural AEW Heavyweight Champion? Another effective performance, even though it's very small, um, I got to give hats off to Dennis Quaid. He is effective as the star quarterback, Jack Cap Rooney, whose fatal injury has led him in a world of great uncertainty. At one point, he contemplates retiring only to get aggressively persuaded by his wife, Cindy, played by Lauren Hawley. The sad part about any given Sunday is that even though it clocks in at two hours and 45 minutes long, roughly, there's very little room for this enormous cast. And some of these are just some of the top acting stars out there. But it's just that they're so, so full, it's so packed that there really isn't much room for development. I mean, in the case of James Woods and Matthew Moutine, sure, they have good support as, as team physicians with contrasting views about the players who have career-threatening positions. And even though he's not an actor per se, but former NFL football player Lawrence Taylor definitely has some strong acting as a veteran player who won't step down unless he gets his big bonus, which sometimes epitomizes just how selfish some football players are, is that they'll, they'll they won't go they won't go sl slowly and gracefully unless they get their last their last severance commission. And, of course, there's also a plethora of familiar faces in both the acting world and the football world, like Carlton Heston. We have LL Cool J as a guy who totally debunks Willie Beeman's uh, position as a player. Uh, we also have some support from Bill Bellamy John and Johnny Unitas as a rival coach who is definitely against Tony D'Amato. The liking elements to this movie is due to the smoke and mirrors approach the story has to offer. There's no telling of what the team does to prepare their ways of winning or understand by those who aren't familiar with the rules of the game. In fact, they don't really focus too much on the on the training and the regimentations of the field that much. Basically, when we, when we see the football players off the field, all they're doing is just partying and having and taking drugs, which is totally untrue. Stone depends mainly on close-ups of their vibrant uniforms and the rough action sequences and the in-your-face sound effects. Yeah, you also have that 
Wilhelm scream. I know I didn't do a good impersonation of that that one, but you know you hear that in a lot of um, movies, video games, TV stuff. The Wilhelm scream that comes also to effect too. It's all done definitely without reason or to get invested into the characters. It's just basically noise for noise sake. There's definitely a lot of mu music in the movie, even though it is predominantly hip-hop and R&B, which promotes an unconvincing video that Jamie Foxx is in. I mean, definitely a bit of the reason why they casted Foxx is just so that he can promote his new music video. But at least I'll say one thing, at least Jamie Foxx definitely has maybe one of the more developed characters in this movie. Even though, even I still felt that even his bigger role was still quite underdeveloped. It was just, it was just though as if Oliver Stone was desperate for attention, so he decided to crank up the tunes to succeed. Or the fact that he knows that this movie was going to clock in at 2 hours and 45 minutes, so let's put out those hip-hop R&B stuff just so that they could keep the young ones glued. Or just so that they could get up from their movie seats and start dancing around, shaking their hips, gyrating and twerking. There's a lot of ground to be covered, but it was all stretched out while throwing in random unknown players, tackling every player they see fit, and added music as a distraction to make casual viewers to ease their minds and not worrying if get if if you get dazed and confused. As long as they have that you know that that song there that 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 you hear a lot in sports movies. It's just so cliche that it's just like, oh, here we go again with that stupid song. When, I mean, you try to get that out of your fucking brains, it just comes back again. But in the end, it's not a completely bad movie. I still highly recommend this film, and the dramatic scenes were definitely worth their time. Pacino shows great acting talent, and his pep talks are quite inspirational, especially with, you know, Dennis Quaid and Jamie Foxx. The script was both warm and witty by Oliver Stone and John Logan. And though I never complained too much about the length of the movies, I wish I think I watch and I think that if they would have cut the film to maybe just around two hours maximum, it would have been better. Yes, if there's really one thing that really strict that really makes this movie stand out is that it goes on for too long. And by the time you get to the end, it's like, how much more can we go? I want to go home. But I can't go home because it hasn't ended yet. And by the time you get to the climax, you just get tired out. And I'm not saying that they should have been about two hours long because of the fact that you may probably think I have a short attention span. I don't. I once watched Anthony and Cleopatra from 1963, and that movie is like fucking four hours long. So if I could sit through a four-hour long movie, then... A two hour and 45 minutes long don't mean shit. But still, you know, I like sports movies, sure. But sports movies does not have to go to that extent. Some people may think football is the most boringest sport going. I mean, I admit there's a lot of starting and stopping. And there's like all these rules. I mean, football seems to have more rules 
and yet it's like one of the most roughest contact sports going, with maybe rugby being like slightly just ahead. Because in rugby, I don't think they even wear helmets. Or maybe they do wear helmets, but they're not like uber protective. I don't know. But football, hey, injuries happen. Careers get ended. Concussions are plenty. Injuries come aboard. It all comes into the game. And it's not just players that also come into the game, but business people, executives, coaches. You know, it's like the army. The players are the soldiers. The coaches are like the sergeants, the drill sergeants. And then the hires up are pretty much the officers, the colonels, the generals. Well, I guess the four-star general would be the commissioner, whoever he or she may be. Now, when I, when I, now notice that I said the name Sharks, the Miami Sharks. I know people are going to say, isn't it supposed to be the Dolphins? Well, I can explain to you. You see, the reason why they changed the names of some of the football teams, like the Miami Sharks instead of the Dolphins, is because the NFL did not want to sponsor this team, did not want to sponsor this movie. And so I guess for a fear of copyright infringement, they decided to just change to another aquatic animal. I'm not going to say a fish because a dolphin is not a fish. It's technically a mammal, an underwater aquatic mammal related in the same category as a porpoise and a whale. That's the reason why they changed it from a shark, from a dolphin to a shark. They did that with all the other teams too. Like think of some other variations of a team. So if I was to give a scale out of 10, I would give any given Sunday a six out of 10. If you could sit through two hours and 45 minutes, then you definitely do have my utmost respect. If you like the sport of football, you probably won't see a lot of football action because you're looking more at the personal lives of the football players, the business side of football. It tries to cover a lot, but it's still not enough. I mean, if you want to see a good movie that looks at the business side, like baseball, I would say just Moneyball. If you want to see maybe some other movie that is football-based, I don't know too many other ones. Maybe The Longest Yard has some football stuff, even though it's not, even though it's not, you know, we, we, real and it's played more as a comedy but um, you know I I mean if you want to watch it for a one-time moment deal or watch it on account of a guilty pleasure then I guess this movie is for you I'm not gonna say I don't recommend it but at the same time I'm not expecting high expectations for you to really fully gravitate to so a 6.5 is pretty fair enough. So I guess this ends my writer review. Thank you all for listening in. If you wish to subscribe to my channel, please feel free to do so. If you wish to leave a comment, go right ahead. But just remember the three simple rules. Be kind, be courteous, and please refrain from any rude comments. And I'll be back again with another movie review. So until next time, this is Eric Hort, writer, saying keep watching those movies, and I'll see you around. Goodbye.